everyone. Welcome to another session of our UCLA MD Chat webinar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Justine Lee. I'm a craniofacial and pediatric plastic surgeon at UCLA. And today we're going to talk about cleft care 101, what to expect when your child has a cleft. Feel free to ask us questions on Twitter using hashtag UCLA MD Chat. So the goals of this talk are to define the common cleft lip and palate anomalies, to kind of give you a treatment algorithm from birth to maturity. Because a lot of times I'm talking to parents on day of life one, and that's a little bit of a shocking conversation to have. And so this is kind of like a, a, a talk that hopefully will give parents and, um, and kids uh, a reference as to what to expect throughout life. And we'll mention, uh, I'll mention three functional issues to feeding, hearing, and speech. So as we know, clefts come in all shapes and forms and sizes. Um, but today we're going to talk about just the common cleft lip and palate. So what do you do if you're a parent and you've just been told your child has a cleft? Well, first of all, take a deep breath and relax. Clefts are common. They affect roughly 1 in 700 kids. They may or may not be associated with other congenital anomalies. Frequently, they're not. And um, having a child means that you're going to go through a process from birth to maturity. But the good news is that these operations are um, done very frequently in major academic centers with cleft teams. And they're generally very safe. Uh, of course, there are surgical risks, as there always are. But these are not typically considered life-endangering surgeries. And the treatments that your child will have are, are not considered to be life-endangering treatments. And also, don't ever forget that, um, that you're not alone, that there are a lot of parents out there that are willing to share and help as they can. And the important thing to remember is that your child can be healthy, can be happy, and grow up to have a wonderful life just like anybody else. So let's start with diagnosis. Um, as with any, uh, with any uh, condition, the first, the first step is to get an actual accurate diagnosis. So these days, uh, three-dimensional ultrasound imaging can now detect many of these clefts uh, prenatally. Uh, sometimes they will miss the cleft, uh, so it's not uncommon to kind of have a little bit of a surprise uh, postnatally too. But once diagnosed, meet with the American Board of Plastic Surgery Certified Pediatric Plastic and Craniofacial Fellowship Trained Surgeon immediately. And if you don't know who's board certified, check the American Society of Plastic Surgeons website, www.plasticsurgery.org, to find a surgeon. And then start thinking about um, finding a multidisciplinary craniofacial team where uh, your child can have team care throughout life. Now, if you're not sure if you have a team near you, you can talk to your plastic surgeon, and usually they can kind of give you an idea of what are the resources around you. And the reason why we recommend a multidisciplinary craniofacial team is it really kind of is a one-stop shop with all of these specialties that will look at your child every year and pretty much give you a, a, a recommendation from everybody on what uh, your child needs for the year and be able to follow your child all the way to the age of 21. And we, we have some patients who come back after the age of 21 too, just to visit or, or question. So let's talk about the different types of clefts. So just to define everything, this is an isolated cleft palate. And what you see here is the uvula. Uh, this is the other side of the uvula. You're looking in the mouth right now. This is the top of the, the upper jaw. So this is the alveolus. That's where the teeth would come out. But this is a baby. And then what you see here is, of course, the cleft palate. And you're looking straight into the nose. So this is a nasal mucosa there. And um, underneath all of this, what is actually functionally wrong with this picture is that there are these muscles here called the levator veli palatini muscles, and they're oriented in the wrong direction. So in a normal cleft, they should be oriented transversely. In a cleft palate, they're oriented in this sort of like, you know, vertically, vertical direction here. Now, what about an incomplete cleft lip? So for terminology's sake, incomplete means not all the way through. So if you have an incomplete cleft lip, you'd have a cleft lip that kind of looks like this. Similar to the situation of a cleft palate, the problem is these muscles here, the orbicularis oris muscles, are split, where they should actually form a continuous ring around the mouth. And as you see, as they get a little bit more severe, you start to see some of this cartilage slumping here. And that's because the cleft goes right through that cartilage, too. 
Now we get to the situation of a complete cleft lip and palate. And like I said, incomplete, not all the way through, complete, all the way through. So you see a cleft palate here that's complete. And again, it's a, a bit more severe than the one you saw before, so you see more cartilage lumping. And this is a situation when you see a unilateral or one-sided complete cleft lip and palate. And this is a bilateral situation where you see both sides cleft lip and palate. Same thing with the muscles are split, the cartilages are slumped, you see the cleft palate. And then here is that prolabium or premaxilla segment. Okay, so the first functional problem to talk about is seating. Um, so a lot of parents ask me, what do I do about seating? because uh, my baby has a hard time um, maintaining suction. And well, the reason for that is because there's a connection between the mouth and the nose, of course. And then sometimes the milk and the formula comes out of the nose. Now this part, the milk and formula coming out of the nose, that is not dangerous. That's very normal. Just sit the baby up and, uh, and he or she will do a lot better, okay? So then what's normal and what do you do if seating is abnormal? So normal is, two to three ounces of seating every three to four hours around the clock, the first couple of weeks, and it, it can't last more than 30 minutes per feed or else the baby gets tired and then kind of starts to feed less. Um, so uh, for kids with clefts, it's very common to do adapters, uh, adapters like the Haberman or Medela feeder, the Enfamil nurser, or um, another patient of mine recently told me about Dr. Brown's feeder, which she really likes. Um, I don't have a preference for any of these. They're all online and you can kind of take a look at them. What I really like is actually syringe feeding because uh, this is what I typically advise parents after we do the lip repair as well as the palate repair. So syringe feeding, similar to the same idea, uh, similar to the idea of the adapters, uh, you're doing a little work for the baby. So instead of having the baby create suction, you're just squirting a little bit of milk or formula into their mouth, comes right up to the lip. And babies tend to like it because it's, it's an easy way to feed. Okay, so now that we've talked about uh, feeding as probably the primary thing that you would face as a parent, let's, let's talk about sort of an overview of cleft care. So this, well, I'll go into each of these in detail in just a minute, but just to give you a sense of what we're, what we're gonna talk about. So once a baby is born, let's say the baby has a complete cleft lip or, and palate. What we uh, typically do is start with nasalveolar molding ASAP. This is a type of orthotic device. Uh, it's, a, it's done by our prosthodontists that help move, it, and it helps move the palatal segments closer and closer to each other. If the baby does not have a complete cleft lip and palate, then this is not a treatment that we would use for, for him or her. At about three to four months uh, is a cleft lip repair. At about 10 to 12 months is a palate repair. At about four to five years, usually before school starts, if the, uh, if the cleft nose um, uh, uh, anomaly looks very severe, then we'll do a little nose uh, tip plasty, so fix up the tip a little bit. After six years of age, after they've started the first phase of orthodontics, uh, what we'll do is put an alveolar bone graft into the palatal segments to, to, to create an actual uh, complete palatal arch, alveolar arch. Um, and then uh, at skeletal maturity, uh, jaw surgery for about 50% of kids, and also a septorhinoplasty for probably the majority of kids. Most of these kids have some deviation in their septum, uh, as well as like uh, breathing issues. So of these, um, of all the things that we do, there are a couple of things that are outpatient. So nasal alveolar molding is outpatient. Um, uh, the cleft nose tip plasty at about four to five years or so of age is an outpatient procedure. Kids go home the same day. Same thing as septorhinoplasty, that's an outpatient procedure. And everything else is inpatient. And of course, I'm not including things like, you know, orthodontics and speech therapy. That, of course, is all outpatient stuff. Okay, so a little bit of detail about everything I talked about. Nasal alveolar molding. So this is what you're looking at. So this thing here, it's a device that's custom made for babies. Uh, again, only complete cleft lip and palate to push the palatal segments together, the alveolar segments together, and to mold the nasal cartilages. The way we do this is, um, this is easier to kind of uh, understand if you've seen it before, but this is actually like a mold of, of a baby. So this is, this is the cleft in the palate. These are the alveolar arches. This is actually the nose of the, of the baby. 
So we make a mold like this, and then we make that custom acrylic device for them. And the device is then placed intraoral and taped to the baby's face, and it's adjusted over several months by our, ortho, or by our prosthodontist in our dental school. And here's a closer look at what, these, uh, what the NAM looks like. So this part here covers the palate. This part is a little button where the rubber bands go. Um, and this part here, these parts are where it covers the alveolus to mold the alveolus. And this is some added material here. So that comes in as the babies grow, as the treatment goes on over the course of uh, several months. And then at the very end of it, there's a little, uh, another little button here that then sort of is uh, put into the, um, the NAM device. And this pushes the nasal cartilages up. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, depending on unilateral versus bilateral. So this is the type of results that you can get from NAM. So um, again, this is all non-surgical stuff. So a uh, baby that started with a cleft that's this, that is this wide ended up with a cleft that's a lot, lot closer together. So the bottom line is we really like it as surgeons because it makes a wide cleft a lot um, smaller and easier for your surgeon. And the secondary benefit, because it covers the palate, is that it can help create a suction for your baby too. Makes feeding a little bit easier. So the next step is cleft lip repair. Again, about three to four months. This is what a baby would look like before the repair. And um, after the repair on the table, this is a type of repair that I like to do. It's a modified Millard rotation advancement repair. It's kind of technical terms, but this is typically what you would like, what you would see um, on the table immediately after surgery and babies heal really fast. This is just the same patient a week after surgery. So all the incisions are already looking really, really nice. And to give you an idea of what they look like as time goes on, this is about, about six to eight months after repair, unilateral. And this is another, this is a bilateral about eight months or so after repair. Okay, so what do we do after repair? Post-operatively, uh, typically, I admit cleft lip patients overnight uh, just to make sure that they're feeding okay and not getting dehydrated. Uh, we start syringe feeding right away. Um, no utensils. I don't like breastfeeding mainly because of pressure on the lip. Um, Bacterial ointment to the incisions, antibiotics for seven days, and then we put no-nos on. These are these arm restraints to prevent the babies from accidentally hitting their faces for about seven to ten days. Um, I'll see him in a week, and then um, restrictions after a week is mainly just let babies be babies. Okay, second functional thing to talk about, hearing. So hearing is extremely important for speech and language acquisition, educational success, and psychosocial well-being of a child. So kids with clefts frequently have eustachian tube dysfunction, so they get fluid in their ears, they get frequent ear infections, and if this is the case, then at the time of palate repair, it's a good time to consider getting ear tubes. Typically, your pediatric ENT doctor or your pediatrician will be able to tell you you have fluid in your, a baby's got fluid in, in his ears or her ears and, you know, time to consider getting ear tubes. Okay. So now let's talk about the cleft palate repair. This is about 10 to 12 months. Reason, uh, the reason we time it at this time is because speech hasn't developed yet. So the palate repair is really important for speech, again, because those muscles are oriented incorrectly because of the cleft. Um, in addition, of course, by closing the connection between the mouth and the nose, feeding gets a lot easier too. So this is, again, what a typical cleft palate looks like. Those are the muscles that are oriented incorrectly and hard to see because it's all in the mouth, but this is typically what it looks like afterwards. So those are those palatal segments now brought together. You see a bunch of sutures in there. Um, and most importantly, underneath all of that, the muscles are now oriented in this transverse direction that allows for the palate to elevate when speaking. Uh, when speaking. So the post-operative cleft palate care, similar to cleft lip care, admission overnight, syringe feeding, um, you'll hear some surgeons out there and some parents who will recommend a cup feeding. That's an excellent choice too. There's nothing wrong with cup feeding. Uh, the only thing is uh, babies tend not to like it as much as syringe feeding. They tend to have a little easier time with syringe feeding than cup feeding. So my preference is to go with syringe feeding. But of course, if your baby is ready to go for cup feeding, that's excellent too. No utensils. Um, Obviously, any utensils inside the mouth might uh, accidentally disrupt the suture line. 
Uh, I typically say no bottle feeding until we're done uh, healing. Um, we typically leave a tongue stitch and that's just for protection. So uh, sometimes uh, because of swelling from the surgery, um, if there's an airway emergency, that we pull on this tongue stitch to, to just, you know, just to help the baby breathe uh, better. And that, that's gone the next morning before the baby leaves the hospital. Again, those arm restraints for 24 hours, um, uh, 24 hours a day for about 10 to 14 days. Um, sometimes we can cut a little shorter. Sometimes we have to keep it on a little longer. It kind of depends on the baby there. Uh, antibiotics for about seven days. I'll see him back in a week. And then again, the restrictions after a week. At some point, we just have to let babies be babies. Okay, and so this is what it looks like before and after again. Muscles there, before and after. From ages one to three, time to take a break. So nothing really to do here before school. Again, consider a little touch up to the nose if it's really asymmetrical. Um, and this is called a cleft tip rhinoplasty. Uh, annual evaluation of speech. And this is the third functional uh, problem to talk about. So hypernasal speech is a speech where uh, when your child is trying to make a sound, air is escaping through the nose. And the reason for that is because by having a cleft, the pal or specifically more of a cleft palate rather than a, a lip, uh, an isolated cleft lip. But by having a cleft, the palate has some um, uh, some inabilities due to scarring as well as the intrinsic anatomy to be able to elevate well and sometimes it's a little short to be able to touch the back of the throat. So this is called velopharyngeal insufficiency or hypernasal speech. Um, one second, let me do the, yeah, here we go. All right, and what you're looking at here, this gray area is a space behind uh, the palate. So let's say you're looking uh, with the baby's head this way and um, the chin is this way. You're looking right at the upper teeth right now. This is the back of the, of the pharynx. You see a little opening here that's all in gray. And when it contracts, it should come down to almost nothing, if completely nothing. So it should touch the back of the throat. So when that doesn't happen, then the problem with hypernasal, hypernasal speech is that it's difficult for your child to speak up sometimes. Sometimes it's difficult for people to understand them. So the first, um, the first way to diagnose this is uh, listen to the child. Have a speech therapist take a listen. Um, usually this can happen at your annual multidisciplinary craniofacial clinic appointment or even at school. Um, and then the next step is to take a look at it with nasal endoscopy. What this is is your uh, speech therapist will then, or pediatric ENT doc, will then put a camera into the nose and actually take a look at the opening while your child is making sounds. So clearly, you can't do this in a really small kid, but as the kids get a little older, this is actually pretty well tolerated. And that gives you a really good idea of what the palate is doing when your child is trying to speak. And the first line therapy is treat with speech therapy. But if there's, a, if there's a substantial gap and the speech therapy isn't really getting anywhere, then we're really looking down the lines of uh, having surgery. And this can happen up to 40% of kids with clefts. So this is the type of surgery we do at UCLA. So again, this type of algorithm, there's gonna be some differences between different centers. This is our typical algorithm. We do something called a sphincter of ringoplasty where again, you're looking into the mouth, here's the upper jaw, this is the back of the throat, and what we're doing is we're making cuts in, these, uh, in the back of the, of the throat. Uh, these are in the muscles called the palatal pharyngeal pharyngeus muscles. We elevate that, like, like so, and then we end up making kind of a zigzag pattern. So what happens from this type of operation is, look at the gray areas here. So this open area becomes a lot smaller than it was before. So by decreasing the size of this port, it allows for the palate to actually touch the back of the throat a lot easier. Okay, so it's a lot easier to then phonate, a lot easier to then speak. So the post-operative pharyngoplasty care is very similar to a palate um, admission overnight. Kids a little older, so now we're talking about what kind of food, usually a liquid diet or a soft diet, as long as it's nothing crunchy. So no chips, no um, seeds, uh, nothing really, really crunchy because it actually can sometimes get stuck in the incision. So that goes on for about seven to 10 days. 
Light snoring, that's normal after these procedures, and it tends to decrease after the swelling comes down. Antibiotics for seven days, follow up in a week with no activity restrictions. So now we're at greater than six years of age. We are almost there. <laughs> so at this point in time, the six-year molars come in, and it's time to see a cleft orthodontist. The reason why you need to see a cleft orthodontist is because the palatal segments, when there's a gap in there, the palatal segments actually collapse down. And what the um, cleft orthodontist can do for you is put in something called a palatal expander here. So that is hooked up to these six-year molars and actually expands the palate out to a dental arch that is, that, is, uh, that is about normal. And once that's expanded out to a dental arch, then we start to think about alveolar bone grafting so that the orthodontist can start to move some teeth into the grafted areas. So this is a typical patient um, who is older than six years, uh, six years of age. She's had her palatal expansion, and this is typically what she looks like. Now, not everybody has had a cleft nose tip plastia at age four or five, and that's fine. And so she hasn't. So you see the cleft, uh, the slumping of the cartilage here. And you also see a gap, uh, a gap in the bone right here, and that's where that alveolar cleft is. And so that's where we're going to put the bone graft in, because actually it's actually completely empty in there at the level of the bone. Uh, this is what it looks like when we're doing a cleft nose tip plasty. You see how asymmetric the cartilages are. This is a normal side. This is a slumped um, cleft side. Um, and that we fix with a little piece of, uh, of um, ear skin slash cartilage graft um, that's been placed to recreate, uh, to actually help the, the slumped cartilages become closer to, to symmetric to the other side. Um, so at the end of an alveolar bone graft, um, we typically admit these kids overnight again, liquid and soft diet. Pain typically is more in the hip than in the face. Uh, I'm not going to show you any photos of the alveolar bone graft because uh, there's not a whole lot to see, really. It's, uh, it's all in the mouth, and it's hard to really sh see exactly what's going on. But the, the bone comes from the hip and is then transferred to the cleft. Antibiotics for about seven days. Um, we typically will prescribe some mouthwash if the uh, child can, can tolerate that. It doesn't have to be mouthwash. It could be like uh, some dilute um, saline or some dilute hydrogen peroxide. Follow up in a week. And uh, typically no PE or sports until the hip, the hip is healed. So this is what it looks like. So this is uh, just looking at the nose part. So this is when, um, when we, at the end of the operation, uh, maybe about a couple weeks out of the operation, what the nose looks like after getting a uh, cleft nose tip plasty. So the cartilage slumping is better. Now this is the alveolar bone graft. Remember you saw that little dip here. And so that's that dip gone filled up with bone. All right. Now we're pretty much um, at, at the end of cleft care. So we're finally at skeletal maturity. So what are we worried about in skeletal maturity? Well, a lot of these kids have something called maxillary hypoplasia. So this happens in about 50% of kids even. And the reason for this is because it is an intrinsic deficiency in the growth of the upper jaw uh, just because the kid's got a cleft. Um, now, there's also, and there, there are also extrinsic reasons for maxillary hypoplasia. Um, there's a lot of surgery that's been done. There's a lot of scarring that's been done. And all of these things uh, contribute to, um, to diminishing the, the growth of the upper jaw. So what happens when you have this type of um, maxillary hypoplasia is that your teeth actually don't meet, and so you get a very severe underbite. Um, and this is not good for bite mechanics, and also it changes the facial profile too. Uh, and the last thing that kids tend to have is a septal rhinoplasty, because again, as I mentioned, most of these kids have septal deviations or bone spur, breathing issues like that. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, maxillary hypoplasia, 50% of kids, intrinsic and extrinsic issues. So the goal is to, to get to a normal occlusion and restore facial harmony. Okay, so this is a, um, a girl before her jaw surgery. She doesn't look too bad, really. But, you know, you can see sort of the difference between before jaw surgery and after jaw surgery. A lot more projection in in her cheek here, 
and, um, and there's more projection in her nose curve too. So that's actually kind of nice for facial harmony, kind of evens things out for her. Most importantly, this is what her teeth look like. So they didn't even meet to begin with. So you can see how, like, how much of a severe underbite she had. And at the end, after we correct it, her teeth are now meeting and she can eat pretty much normal food, okay? Postoperative for jaw surgery care, admission for two days. This is gonna be the longest admission. Um, sometimes it can take a little bit longer. It depends on how uh, each kid uh, heals. So sometimes it's kind of painful. It's not the, the nicest surgery to go through. Um, liquid or pureed diet, advancing to soft diet. Again, nothing crunchy, no seeds, no chips, things like that. Pain medications as needed. Antibiotics for about, about seven days. Mouthwash, mouthwash tends to really help here because it's hard to brush your teeth when you've got these incisions in your mouth. Uh, so until that heals, mouthwash is the way to go. Um, we typically ask that the kids sleep with the head of bed elevated by about two pillows and follow up weekly for the first four weeks because there tend to be rubber bands that we need to adjust. And also to see the orthodontist within the first four weeks after surgery. So this surgery in particular is a really, really close collaboration with a cleft orthodontist. And restrictions, no PE or contact sports for about eight weeks. A little longer because we need that bone to heal really nice and solid um, before returning to PE and contact sports. Okay, last surgery. So rhinoplasty. Like I said, a lot of these kids have this curve in, in the septum uh, that's very common, especially for the unilateral cases. The bilateral cases tend to have slightly less of a curve, maybe more like bony spurs that have been replaced, sometimes in the way of, of breathing. Uh, cartilage slumping is still there. So this is a process. So you work, we just kind of work on it as an infant, work on it when the kids are in like primary school, work on it on the very last surgery too. And what we can do with rhinoplasty is straighten out the uh, septal deviation and fix up the cartilage slumping as much as we can one last time um, before having the kids graduate from cleft care. And this is a profile view of the same kid. Um, so typically we'll, we'll straighten out the profile too if there's like bumps and all that, but the, this is also partially due to de deviation where that bump becomes a little bit more obvious too. So postoperatively for rhinoplasty care, this is an outpatient procedure, regular diet as tolerated, pain medications as needed, antibiotics for seven days. Uh, we usually ask that the patients don't blow their nose, sleep with the head of bed elevated, again, just to kind of decrease the amount of swelling, follow up in a week to remove dressings, and no uh, PE or contact sports for about six to eight weeks. So that is all of cranial facial care, uh, sorry, cleft care in a nutshell. Uh, in half an hour. And um, also I'd like to invite everyone out there watching to our UCLA Cranial Facial Clinic annual Cranial Facial Anomaly Picnic. So this is a really fun event for uh, kids and families with cleft and cranial facial issues. It's August 6th this year from 1 to 4 p.m. UCLA Sunset Canyon Rec Center on the Mesa lawn. Please RSVP um, if you're interested in coming and let us know how many will be attending. Uh, we do have a, a cap. Um, as it's a bit of a popular event. Um, and uh, this is my information. If there are any questions that come up um, after the webinar that uh, weren't asked on Twitter today, I'm happy to help and answer any of those questions. Okay, so we'll take some questions now. Okay, so starting with how common is cleft? So the typical common cleft lip and palate, like the, the rough number that, that is, is good to remember is one in 700. Um, there are some variations, meaning that uh, in Asian populations a little higher, um, in you know, non-Asian populations or non-Latino populations maybe a little bit lower. The causes of cleft and is it preventable? Well, um, the problem with, with talking about the causes, the causes of cleft is that it, it's multifactorial. So there's so many causes of cleft that there really aren't very preventable at this point in time. Um, know that they're not all genetic. Some of it is like environmental, but there's so many causes. Um, I think if you're thinking about um, is, it, is there anything you can do to uh, not go down this road of having to go through cleft care, then just excellent prenatal care. 
uh, I think that's like the number one first thing to do and then let everything else just happen. How common is cleft surgery in children? Any side effects we should prepare for? Uh, cleft surgery in children is very common. Um, we, uh, for major academic centers, especially in the US. So it's very common, we do it all the time. Um, side effects to prepare for. Um, the functional issues like speech, uh, speech problems, hypernasal speech, that's probably the major side effects to uh, prepare from. Most of these kids, again, they're not undergoing life-threatening surgeries most of the time. Yes, you know, surgery, there are risks, there are complications that can happen, but generally these are sort of like either outpatient or overnight stays. Anything else? Okay, great. Wonderful to have everyone listen in today again on Cleft Care 101, um, another installment of our UCLA MD Chat webinar series, and I hope to see you all soon.